Module W, end of life care. We're gonna be talking about our role as nurse aides in end of life care, some cultural differences when we deal with the, um, end of life care and our own feelings. Because it is important to understand and examine our own feelings about end of life before we go take care of those who are in that stage. End of life care is defined as support and care provided during the time surrounding death. Now this can last days, weeks, or months. Terminal illness is an illness or injury from which the person will not likely recover. A terminal illness ends in death. Dying, this is the near end of life and near cessation of bodily functions. Death is when um, is the end of life and cessation of bodily functions. Postmortem care is the care of the body after death. An obituary is, to, is a description typically placed in a local newspaper of a resident, resident's life. It's going to include listing of relatives, birth information, accomplishments and activities, and death. And it's written upon the death of the resident. Death, of course, is the natural conclusion to life. Death may be sudden and unexpected, or it's an expected occurrence. Residents' response to death is based on personal, cultural, and religious beliefs and experiences and affects both our emotions and our behaviors. The nurse aides feeling about death affect the care that is given. Because the nurse aides are often the caregiver closest to the resident, the nurse aide must understand the dying process and know how to react and approach the resident with care, kindness, and respect. Grief is the deep distress or so so sorrow excuse me, over a loss. This is a dynamic and personal process. The dying resident and family may pass through the five stages of grief, grief according to Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. The five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Each person may experience the stages at different rate and time, and some may stay in one stage until death. Others may bounce back and forth between the stages. It may not even be possible, possible for a person to pass through the stage if death is fast or unexpected. The nurse aide's role is to understand these stages and not take anger personally, be able to listen and ready to assist. And we're going to talk about each of the stages. And keep in mind that this is stages of grief that the both your resident or patient is going to be going through, family members are going to be going through, and you may be going through as well. Stage one is denial. This begins when people are told of impending death. They may refuse to accept the diagnosis or discuss the situation. They may believe that it was a mistake um, and they demand the labs be repeated. They may act like it's not really happening. This is the no, not me stage. Stage two, anger. This is expressions of rage and resentment. This is a normal and healthy reaction. They are often upset by the smallest things, lash out at anyone. They begin to face the possibility of an upcoming death. They may be angry because of the healthy lifestyle that they maintain throughout their life. The nurse aide may be the target of anger, but don't take it personally. This is the why me stage. The third stage is bargaining. This is when the person tries to arrange for more time to live to take care of unfinished business. Bargains with the doctor, they may bargain with God. This stage is usually private and spiritual. This is the yes, me, but stage. Stage four is depression. This is when the person begins the process of mourning, cries, withdraws from others. They may become weaker and symptoms are worsening. They may lack the strength to do simple things. They will need additional assistance with physical care and emotional support. This is the yes, me stage. The nurse aide needs to demonstrate understanding and a willingness to listen. Stage five is acceptance. This is when the person has worked through feelings and understands that death is imminent. Uh, these patients will now, and people will now have a sense of calm. They will be at peace and accept death. Some may not make it to this stage. This is the stage that the person begins to get their affairs in order, financial and personal affairs. They may make plans for the care of pets or others. They may plan for their funeral. Reaching the stage of acceptance does, acceptance does not necessarily mean that death is imminent. Advanced care planning. 
And we're going to talk about advanced care planning and advanced directives, living wills, and durable health care powers of attorney, because these are all terms that we want to be familiar with. Advanced care planning, these are choices an individual makes about the medical care the individual would want to receive if he or she suddenly became incapacitated and could not speak for themselves. These choices are based on personal values, preferences, and discussions with loved ones. Advanced directives, this is, um, well, the Patient Self-Determination Act and the Omnibus Reconciliation Act give the people the right to choose and accept, or, sorry, I should say accept or refuse treatment. It also gives persons the right to make advanced directives. It requires that healthcare facilities that receive Medicare and Medicaid funds give residents who are newly admitted information about their right, relate, rights related to advanced directives. In short, an advanced directive, directive excuse me, is a legal document that allows people to decide what kind of medical health care they wish to have in the event that they cannot make those decisions themselves. This may include living wills or dur and or durable powers of attorney. It's important to know for you and for your residents and your family members that advanced directives can be changed or canceled at any time by the person. Legally, the nurse aide must honor advanced directives. Advanced directive documents, so living will. This is the document that outlines the medical care a person wants or does not want in case the person cannot make those decisions. A living will must be written while the resident is mentally competent or by the resident's legal representative. A durable health care power of attorney is a signed, dated, and witnessed legal document that appoints someone else to make health care decision for the person in the event that he or she cannot do so. Many of you have probably heard of a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. This is a choice of the resident, of course. This is a medical order that instructs medical professionals not to perform CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation if the person no longer has a pulse and or is breathing. This tells the healthcare team that the resident does not wish any extraordinary members, measures excuse me, to be used if the resident suffers a cardiac or respiratory arrest. Extraordinary measures include interventions used to restore the heartbeat or respiratory effort, such as CPR. A DNR is typically written for a person with a terminal illness, a person who almost certainly could not be saved if CPR was initiated, and legally the nurse aide must honor the resident's DNR and not initiate CPR if they have one. All right, so a doctor's or so physicians orders for life sustaining treatment. These are doctors orders stating what treatments are to be used when a person is very sick. It includes medical measures that the resident wants to receive and those that they do not want to receive. This is based on conversations between the resident and the doctor. And it's going to be based on beliefs, goals, diagnosis, prognosis, and what options are available. You probably have heard of hospice. So hospice is a healthcare agency or program for people who are dying. Now, usually hospice care is for those who have less than six months to live. However, just because someone is on hospice does not mean that you know, they could live for years. So the purpose of hospice care is to improve the quality of life for the person who is dying. It provides comfort measures and pain management while preserving dignity, respect, and choice. Hospice care offers empathy and support for the resident and the family. They work with staff as well as the resident and the resident's family members. Now, palliative care is different, um, whereas hospice care, the goals are resident comfort and dignity. Um, the type of care, palliative care, um, is given to residents who are dying, and it focuses more on relieving pain, controlling symptoms, and min minimizing side effects and complications. Our role um, in, in these end-of-life care um, situations is to be a good listener, respect privacy and independence, give individualized care, and again, be aware of our own feelings and stresses that we may feel during these times. We have to take care of ourselves as healthcare providers to be able to provide um, palliative care or hospice care to others. End of life care. Um, most people die in hospitals or long-term care facilities. 
So our feelings again about death affect the care we give. We need to be caring, kind, and respectful to both the dying resident and the family. Uh, nurse aides must recognize and deal with their own feelings and attitudes toward death in order to provide the essential support to the resident who is dying. Many factors influence our attitudes, such as age, personal experience, culture, and religion. Our first encounters with death and dying can be frightening, and the nurse aide can use coworkers as a support system for dealing with these experiences. Chaplains are also really great resources. So environmental needs of the resident who is dying, we want to keep the resident's environment as normal as possible. We want to have a well-lit, well-ventilated room. We can open doors and drapes, play residents' favorite music. We want to make sure that they're positioned in the most comfortable position possible for breathing and avoiding pain. And we do this, of course, by maintaining body alignment and changing positions frequently, at least every two hours or more often as needed. Cleanliness is important, and this includes skin care, back rubs, bathing, and grooming, mouth care and nose care, cleaning sores in, um, or bleeding in the mouth, make sure to follow standard precautions, providing oral care as needed. This may include covering the lips with a thin layer of petroleum jelly, checking for difficulty swallowing or choking, cleaning the nose, and often offering drinking water as often as possible. Mouth care is one of the most overlooked skills, and it's really important. Nutrition and elimination. We want to offer the resident their favorite foods, including uh, liquids or semi-liquids. Offer foods frequently and in smaller amounts. A balanced diet is not a primary concern, of course, for the dying resident. We want to keep the resident's skin clean and dry, their linens clean and dry, and provide peri care as often as necessary. And of course, there are emotional and psychological needs of the dying resident and the family. So we want to approach the resident and the dying process with dignity, knowing that each resident's idea of death and spiritual beliefs is going to be different and respect. we want to respect it, offer support and understanding, respect their preferences regarding the solitude or interaction, listen to the resident and the family, we can use touch where appropriate, communicate with the resident even if they're non-responsive by identifying ourselves and explaining everything that's going to be done before it's done, um, be present and positive, give resident and family privacy, but not necessarily isolation. Try to take time to spend with the resident, even when you're not providing care. Don't take that anger directed at us personally, be supportive, respect spiritual beliefs, and encourage family members to participate as much as they can. So culture and religion provide the framework within which personal experiences like death uh, take on meaning. Our personal experiences, our culture, our religion, our age, um, these all influence uh, our personal beliefs about death. We have to make sure that as caregivers, we're not imposing our own beliefs upon the resident who is dying, their family, or the people closest to them. It's important to uh, kind of discover specific cultural issues in order to provide the most respectful care to the resident who is dying as we can. Individuals from different cultures appreciate being asked about their practices. So you could ask things like, who's allowed to provide personal care? Do, does the resident or family have any special customs? Are there any specific post-mortem customs that the staff should know? So some cultures believe dying at home is preferable while others fear death at home. In the Chinese culture, for example, traditional healing practices include using herbal preparations. Um, autopsy and disposal of body are not permitted. Um, in the Japanese culture, the number four means death, so sometimes getting medication four times a day could be a problem. In the Vietnamese culture, they believe in reincarnation, so quality of life is more important than uh, length of life. In the Hindu culture, um, persons are often accepting of God's will they desire to be clear-headed at the time of death, so they might not want some medication that fogs their brain, right? Um, cremation is preferred, and they believe in reincarnation.
It's important to realize that even if the dying process is prolonged, staff and family may not actually be prepared, for, may not be prepared for the actual moment of death. So staff and mem family members may be shocked or surprised when death actually happens, even though you knew it was coming and those feelings are normal. We wanna recognize a variety of feelings and responses that may be displayed, guilt, anger, depression, avoidance, denial, acceptance, and relief. We wanna listen empathetically, be caring, observe for changes in other residents, right? Um, if you have a roommate, you observe your, the roommate for signs of depression and record and report as appropriate. There are signs um, of impending death. And these are signs that um, we're within hours or days of death. And we wanna make sure we're reporting these. Psychological and physical withdrawal, decreased level of alertness with increased periods of sleeping, a rise in body temperature, circulatory system fails, so this, the pulse is, could be either fast or slow, weak and irregular, blood pressure drops, the extremities may become cold and pale, and you may see the modeling, which kind of looks like bruising of, this, of the extremities. Respiratory system begins to fail with erratic breathing patterns, irregular, rapid, and shallow, or slow and heavy. Um, you may have heard of Cheney Stokes breathing. This is when the resident takes several shallow breaths followed by periods of no breathing for five, 30, or even 60 full seconds. It's important to know with the Cheney Stokes breathing, it does not cause discomfort for the resident. They may also have noisy respirations, mucus collecting in the airway, which causes that rattling or gurgling sound. One of the reasons uh, mouth care is so important or apnea is which is when respiration stops. Our digestive system slows down, so we may actually see distension of the abdomen, incontinence, nausea, and vomiting. The urinary system, um, we have changes there as well. The urine may become dark and very small amounts because we're having decreased blood supply to the kidneys. Our kidneys are slowing down and shutting down, and also incontinence can occur. Um, starting in the feet and legs and move, um, moving up, muscle tone begins to decrease and is lost. Eventually, the mouth muscles relax and the jaw is going to sag and the body becomes limp. Our sensory perception declines as death is impending. We, have, we may have blurred and failing vision. You may see that the resident is staring yet not really responding or blinking. Touch is diminished. Now, keep in mind, hearing is believed to be the last sense to be lost, which is why we continue to communicate with our residents even if they're not responding. We continue to, talk, we continue to introduce ourselves, explain procedures, etc. And pain is going to decrease the loss of consciousness. Signs that the resident has died, and we, of course, also are notifying the resident immediately. No pulse or heartbeat, no respirations, no blood pressure, pupils that become fixed and do not respond to light, no response when being talked to or touched, eyelids may remain open within large pupils, the mouth may remain open, and they may have incontinence of bowel and bladder. So it also often falls on, on our role as nurse aides to perform, perform post-mortem care. Again, post-mortem care is defined as body, uh, care of the body after death, and it's done to maintain a good appearance of the body, and it begins when the resident is pronounced dead. You can consult with the nurse to find out if dentures are inserted or left out, if rings are removed um, and kept secure for family members, Within two to four hours of after death is when rigor mortis begins to develop and that's the stiffening of the body. So it's important to position the body in a normal alignment before this occurs. Understand that because postmortem care involves movement of the body, air may escape from the lungs and be expelled from the intestines causing sounds to be heard. Do not let these sounds scare you as they are normal and to be expected. In postmortem care, we're gonna give the, the patient a a, a bath, a bed bath, comb their hair, put on a clean gown, clean shirt sheets, put a peri pad underneath because of fluids sometimes still being released. Position the body in a supine position with their legs straight, arms folded across the abdomen, and with one pillow under the head. 
Each facility has its own policy regarding postmortem care, and you need to follow that policy. So care of the family after death. Show the family members to a private place to sit where they can talk privately. Ask if there's anyone else they need to be called. Provide water or other beverage. If the family member wants to visit with the deceased, make sure to provide privacy, um, close the door, and do not rush them. Nurse aides respond differently to, de to the death of a resident. Um, you may not know what to say. Um, you may cope with the death by tending to talk too much. Um, but try and just offer your support and listen. Uh, a lot of times people wonder what to say. The key is to be sincere and understand that sometimes a simple I'm sorry is enough. And try to avoid the non-therapeutic responses like she is in a better place or it's for the best. Um, you could say something instead like your mom's going to really be missed here. So um, again, this can be a, a difficult or scary experience the first time it happens. Um, but you can always ask for support from your coworkers, from a chaplain, from a supervisor.